I'd like to introduce you. Um, so, Sanjoy, thank you very much for agreeing to do this for us, especially in your now very interesting state, halfway here and halfway there. Um, I think everyone on, online knows you, but even if they don't, Sanjoy was uh, nearly 10 years our security officer in the shul. Uh, and he's had a very interesting life up to now, for starting off in, in Glasgow, um, going to Israel, New Zealand, and finally coming back here, but now it looks like New Zealand again. But meanwhile, he picked up a, a wonderful wife, Beverly, and they have two lovely, lovely children. And at, the, at this moment in time, Sandro at least is in Edgware, but um, I think he might not be for very long. But let's hear about his life. Over to you, Sandro. Okay. Well, thank you very much. And first of all, thank you very much for those people uh, dialing in or, or calling in. I didn't expect that I'd have, there'd be anyone interested really. But these these are the things how how, how they are. Um, so I, you know, I always regard myself as not having had a particularly remarkable life, but others say that it has been a bit of a, an interesting life. Um, I was born in Glasgow in 1970 um, on the 5th of April, and that's quite an interesting date. I only found this out when I was 35. Anyone who's a tax accountant will know what this uh, the second meaning of, of of April the fifth is. And I asked my and my mother always used to try me. She always said, you know, it was always tax advantageous for you being born on April the fifth. And then um, he told me that I was um, expect I was actually due on the first of April, but I was running late. So she um, it came up to April the fifth, and she said on the advice of her, she decided to have to have me induced in order to claim the tax uh, and she said it did brilliantly for many many years she said we were able to claim child benefit on you till you're like 25 or something and uh, she said it, I think it made 400 pounds difference in 1970 which in 1970 69 70 tax year was was quite a substantial amount um, so she said it was a very good <laughs> good day to be born so um, it was interesting because my Parents, um, you know, they always have family photos of these things. I had, um, I had, um, that's my dad and my uh, mum uh, and me when I was about four years old. Um, my dad was um, an army officer. He started off, uh, um, he finished up as a colonel. Um, that's him when he was younger. Oh. And this is him when he was older. Um, uh, quite severe looking and not particularly happy at retiring, I suspect. He wasn't a man given to humour, um, quite unlike my mother. Um, but they were a very interesting mix. Um, my dad wasn't Jewish, my mum was. Um, and um, they met in... Uh, they sound quite romantic, but uh, my mother was born in the south of India, but moved up to the north of India to a place called Lucknow, where my dad was based. And uh, my mother tried to was learning how to drive a car, so she went to this large area. Um, and every morning, my dad would go riding there. He was a, an army officer. He'd, he'd, he'd been in a cavalry regiment, and he'd always had access to horses. So. Um, he used to go riding there, and that's how they met. She was learning to drive, which is, I have to say, a skill she never quite mastered. She never got a driving license. Um, and uh, my dad was horse riding, and that's that's how they met. And um, they got married in um, 1969, which was, again, it was strange because my mother, by that time, she'd moved to the UK from India in 1967. And... Um, you know, I think the idea was they'd get married, then they'd get back together, but it, it never quite happened. So when when I when I was born, my, my, my dad was off 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 in India, the Indian Army. Um and um you know uh, he came I think he came twice on he got furlough from the army, got like three to four months off. And I think he came nine, I think 1970, just after I was born he came. And then you think again in about 72 or 73. And um, yeah, they're, they're both quite remarkable people in their own right. I mean, my mum uh, was one of nine children. Um, in fact, I think she's 
she's the last i think she's the last of the nine um to live um she's one of the younger ones but um you know she's one of nine her parents uh, her dad um and his family are are fun enough from england uh they, they left um the united kingdom in 1815 just after the napoleonic wars um which sounds quite an odd timeline but what i've realized in my family is that everyone gets married late so um my mother got married when she was 30 i think she was 34 um she had me when she was 35 my her dad and her dad was born in 1882 uh and had her when he was god well into his 50s um and that wasn't the last child get another three or four kids afterwards um with the relationship that my mum and my dad had it's no surprise you know we basically we'd see my dad once a year um so we'd fly over to india and usually we'd go by some exotic country so we we'd go through syria we'd go fly via yemen places which are all in the kind of lists of places you really don't want to go if you're jewish at all but um they were quite exciting places to visit beirut in 1974 just before the civil war because uh, as my mother always said you'd get great duty free and the toys were cheap uh so i was more interested in the toys my mum <clears throat> didn't really drink but she'd always give the, the booze away and certainly the duty free chocolate we'd munch through that but it was it was always quite an exciting place to to go and going to india certainly with my dad when he was posted what you do be a garrison commander commanding a battalion or something the Indian Army is quite old fashioned in some ways. You had um, Bindi's like this anyway, you have a myriad of servants. So I remember we were uh, stationed, I remember spending a month and a half in Kashmir in uh, 1974. And we had a retinue just for the three of us of 11 servants. Um, we had drivers, we had cooks, we had people who would do things. And uh, my, my dad in his area had um, a cavalry regiment, so I was sent down every morning to learn to ride. And it's something I've always enjoyed doing, so it's something I picked up then, something I picked up off him. But um, the relationship wasn't to last, and we were in Glasgow. My mother was an English teacher in a secondary school. Um, and, uh, you know, I think the last time I saw my dad uh, as a child, was when I was um, six years old. It'd be January 1977. Uh, it was the last time we went to see him. We'd, we'd flown to India. Can't remember. We stopped in Moscow. That was right. Um, flew to India and then took a two and a half day train journey across India um, to go and see him and then spent a couple of weeks with him. But then that was the last time I saw him until 1992. So I didn't have much relationship with my dad he um we kept writing in those days you know write aerograms um which once we then kind of tailed off on my side as i got older and then i think the last time i was in contact with him was probably about 1984 and then it was only in 1992 that he, he came back in um uh, to my life and you know it's funny i was i was thinking this morning what things do i have of his um and to be honest with you, you didn't I don't really have that much. I've got uh, a Parker 61 pen that he bought in, funnily enough, what was then the Belgian Congo. That was his first kind of, uh, was his first war, second war. Um, in, he was with the UN as a peacekeeper. I've got um, a beer mug uh, because he used to like to have, especially in the heat, he'd always have a, a beer at dinner, half pint. And this is the beer mug that I still use to, to drink. Not, I don't really like beer myself, but I use it to drink juice or water. And he gave me a, a watch that, um, again, had seen him through, I think, three or four different wars. Um, he'd had quite a life. Uh, uh, my mum was his second marriage. And this is something, again, I only discovered um, probably in 1992 when he came to the UK, came back into my life. I, 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 he'd written to my mother, my mother kind of chucked the letter away, but then he wrote again and I made contact. And um, he has a brother in Switzerland, uh, an uncle of mine who lives in Geneva. And I remember picking up the phone, trying to call him and um, 
this uncle of mine, I said to him, I said, um, so, you know, is he there? And, and he said, no, he's not, your dad's not here. I said, right, fine. I said, how is he? Which was probably the most interesting five minutes of my life because he said, well, you know, he's all right. His, his um, first son died um, a couple of, you know, a few years ago. I said, first son? What first son? I thought I was the first son. I thought I was the only son. I said, no, the first son by the first marriage. First marriage? What first marriage? He said, oh, yeah, she, yeah he was married before, before um, uh, your, your mum, you know, your mum was number two. I was like, what? And um, so my, my dad had been married to, he'd been commissioned into a, a Gurkha regiment uh, in the 1940s. And he'd married an Nepalese woman, had a son who, who subsequently died. He um, had, um, I think he had cancer at a very young age, at the age of 35. Um, and I remember a flashback meeting this chap who was a, an older brother. But it was, you know, I was four years old, very small, meeting someone who was older for a very short moment, didn't really mean anything. And then after he divorced my mum, he remarried someone and he has two kids by, um, by, by that marriage who are uh, in the 40s. One was uh, an actress um, and the other one's a, a chef. So, um, you know, you discover that you have family that you didn't really have. Um, so that was kind of his life, if you like. Uh, my mother um, became, as we were growing up, became more religious minded. Um, and we both kind of became more and more religious. I, I got to a stage where I think that was as far as I would go. So um, for me, you know, it was growing up, it was Shama Shabbat, always go to shul. Uh, Judaism was a huge, huge part of our life. I mean, we would travel when whenever we went traveling we'd always uh, try and buy or get hold of kosher supplies um and um i went to jewish primary school in glasgow calderwood which was um not didn't particularly like it it was um quite a, a tough rough school i mean um you know smacking and thrashings were, were basically you know if you if you got a one particular teacher if you if you made a spelling mistake or or, or, or made an error in your arithmetic, you got smacked for it. So I wasn't particularly good at arithmetic, so and I still can't do long division to this day. Um, but um, it was quite hard. And I remember thinking, like, my goodness me, if this is what Jewish schools are like, what are the non-Jewish schools are like? And then I went to a non-Jewish school and discovered that actually they were a lot easier <laughs> and a lot better organized. Um, but um, yeah, so I, I, I went, went to school, went to Jewish primary school, Went to non-Jewish secondary school, which did Hebrew. It was the only uh, secondary school in Scotland which did Hebrew, um, and uh, that's why I went. I went there. It was a good school, very mixed school, um, but um, it was it was a lot of fun. And I suppose um, social life came into a bit more of my element there. Um, and then, you know, particularly wasn't academically good at, at primary school. In fact. I always rank myself with pride as being kind of like the bottom or near bottom of the class. I just wasn't interested. But on the other hand, uh, as someone pointed out to me, you were the first person in your primary school to go and do a PhD. And actually I was the youngest person to do a PhD, uh, you know, uh, from who had ever gone to my school. And when I went to university, I was the youngest PhD in my faculty ever. Um, so that wasn't too bad. But um, yeah, I went to secondary school finished secondary school at 17, went on to university, uh, Glasgow University, where my mother had gone and which was really, I suppose, the making of me. I mean, I had, um, uh, you know, they always say that Oxbridge is a bit of a network. In Glasgow, the university is a bit of a mafia. Um, you know, so I went to, you know, it was in the same year as people like Nicholas Sturgeon, who's now the first minister, other people as well. I mean, we, we still kind of keep in contact uh, more, more through social media, but um, it was quite an illustrious group of people and it was it was good fun. Um, I got involved very much in university debating. I was very much involved in the Jewish Student Society. Um, and while I was there, we had these tremendously long summers. So I used to get involved in all sorts of things. So the first year I went off in, uh, to Israel to teach disabled children how to ride horses, uh, riding school for disabled. And then the second year, I thought, well, listen, I really want to make Aliyah. So there was um, a program called 
uh, Murva, which was kind of for people from outside of Israel who wanted to do the army. And the deal was that if you did your three, four months with them, it was the equivalent of basic training, you would get a year knocked off your military service if you made Aliyah by the time you were 24. So that was an attractive prospect. So instead of doing three years, you'd do two years, or instead of, you know, when you're between 21 and 24 in those days, it was two years service, you'd go down to one year. So I signed up for it. And um, it was uh, a bit of a shock to the system. I mean, Julian's on the call and, you know, he knows what I'm like. Um, and, and Paul's there as well. Um, and it's a huge shock to the system, but it kept me very, very fit. Um, it gave me some very good military skills. And when I eventually finished, when I finished, I, I ended up, my PhD was like, well, let's look at training in the army. So I was originally going to look at how you compare recruit training in Britain and Israel, but it, the Israeli side fell through. So I focused on the British army and, and doing that PhD, I, I um, ended up with a supervisor by the name of Richard Holmes, um, who at that time was Colonel Eaton. He became head of defense reserves for the UK. He was in charge of had a command of about 86,000 people. He was um, a professor, but he also uh, headed up the Army, Navy, Air Force, Royal Marine Reserves, um, and written a whole range of books. But he basically said to me, he said, listen, if you're gonna do this PhD free, there's nothing else for it, you're gonna to have to sign up. And he said, he said, on the one hand, you know, you'll be paid. On the other hand, if the balloon goes up, you're off with the troops. Uh, <laughs> And um, we managed to fast track things. So I got posted to an infantry regiment, <clears throat> which is now the rifles. Those days it was kind of what was called heavy infantry. Um, but so I was recruited into the, uh, you know, the rifles at the Duke of Edinburgh in those days and um, seconded into the Royal Engineers. So I learned basic, I was sent off to Sandhurst um, on a short course, um, which was good fun again. You know, if you've been through the military before, it's kind of the same sort of kind of system, the same kind of stuff that you're used to running around, endless amounts of repetitive stuff designed to keep you in trim and give you discipline. And you just get used to it. So I ended up um, doing my PhD, but I ended up in the British Army for, I was signed on initially for three years, I ended up there for five years. Um, but um, it didn't see anything in particularly which was, uh, shocking. Went to Northern Ireland a couple of times. Um, you know, uh, went did a lot of um, advice, looking at, you provided a lot of advice and input on the restructuring of of um, the army, British Army between regular and reserves. Um, and did my PhD, which uh, because it looked at recruit training, and recruit training certainly in the British Army often involves a lot of swearing and, and creative use of, 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 of abuse, of, of verbal abuse. You know, when it came to my PhD, it was, I was like, well, what do I do with all these words? You know, do I bleep them out? Do I, you know, I think, well, like, like you know, people aren't idiots. Um, so I've always said my, my PhD thesis is more, more swear words than a transcript of Pulp Fiction than the script of Pulp Fiction. It's, it's literally laced with, with swearing. Uh, but it, I thought it would keep the reader awake anyway, so that 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 was kind of me. Um, so I finished up that, and then uh, I was living in a place called Cranfield, where I did my PhD, which has no Jewish community at all. It's the middle of Bedfordshire. It has an airport and an airfield, uh, and in Jewish wise, it was you know I had a choice. I remember coming there. And I thought, I have a choice. I can either keep Shabbat or not keep Shabbat. I can either keep kosher or just chuck it all away. And so I made the decision to, you know, I could either go down that route, in which case, where would I be um, in terms of my kind of anchors? So I kept Shabbat for five and a half years. I would make the effort. I would drive down to London um, like once a fortnight, get kosher bread, stick it in the freezer, buy kosher food, stick it in the freezer and just um, survive off that. I would, um, Friday nights, you know, would be Friday night. Uh, Shabbat would be Shabbat. I would uh, daven and then go to the university library and read. Um, it was quiet, but I have to say it was the best thing 
best choice I ever did because the level of work and intensity and research that I was doing was during the week, I'd be working often, I'd be starting work usually about nine, get into the office about 9.30, 10 o'clock. But apart from an hour for lunch and an hour, an hour and a half for two hours for dinner, I'd be working till one or two in the morning every night. Um, and if you're doing that seven days a week, you, you kind of, you're not going to be in a good state either mentally or physically. So actually keeping Shabbat really was a good thing. I, I finished the PhD uh, and uh, then moved back up to Scotland for a bit. Um, had a great time going back to university. I didn't have didn't have a job, but it was had a great time, uh, a lot of fun. Uh, you know, when you're older, you, know, you kind of know to enjoy how to enjoy yourself a lot more. And then moved down to London in uh, January 1998. Got a couple of friends to help me. Hired a mini bus packed everything into a minibus and moved into a tiny little flat in St John's Wood where my flatmate, a guy called David Barzilai, <clears throat> you know, saying, well, go to the local show, St John's Wood. And he said, no, no, come to South Hampstead. It's much, much nicer, much better fun. And so I remember thinking, all right, well, let's give it a shot. Uh, so I trekked up to South Hampstead and, you know, basically didn't stop, didn't uh, stop not going. And, um, you know, moved to various rented houses around before actually moving into buying a place in, in Constantine Road. Um, but still, I, the idea for me was to be within a certain radius of the shul uh, so I could walk there or be there within an easy distance. So my last place where I lived in, in, in Belsize Park, I actually bought it because it was a flat, but I knew it was within 15 to 20 minutes walk of the shul. And that's always been important. You know, my mother, when I was growing up in Glasgow, we lived in a very, very small village on the outskirts of Glasgow. And the distance to Shul was three miles there, three miles back. So we would walk every Shabbat, <clears throat> three miles there, three miles back, kept us fit. But it was a bit difficult in the snow and the ice. And um, Scotland in the winter, especially Glasgow, that particular part of, of outside of Glasgow, you know, it wasn't difficult to be cut off by snow. So, um, you know, it was quite hard going. So we actually moved when I was about 11 years old into the city in order to be close to the shul. So that's always been a kind of thing for me. Um, and, you know, I remember um, being approached, oh gosh, must be about 2001, by various people saying, look, would you be interested in taking on security for the shul? You've been in the army, you know what you're doing. You think, you know, we think, we think you know what you're doing. And so they, 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 they called me and said, listen, would you mind doing it? I said, okay, do a review, you know, so I took it on and helped by people like Julian, who's on the call, who's been absolutely invaluable. Uh, people like Mark Gold uh, and many, many others got security roads together, got the structures together and actually saw a lot of things through the shul, the old shul in particular, which had its faults, had its issues. It wasn't such a bad building in many ways, certainly from a security point of view, but we had so many, we had lots of issues, especially Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. You know, you'd get, you know, people turning up who you've never seen before. We'd have people who were drunk who would turn up. We had one guy, I remember <coughs> turning up, <coughs> I think it was Purim or something, or maybe, and he said he was Israeli and he appeared to be under the influence of some substance. And he said, I know the rabbi. He said, well, what's his name? It's David. And I was like, well, he can't read the sign out the front. So it seems to be under the influence. Let's not let him in. And then I think Julian came back to me and said, oh yeah, he's been seen trying, trying car door handles, trying to break into cars. <clears throat> you know, occasionally, like once or twice a year, we'd, we'd have to turn people away because they were abusive or, or not particularly pleasant. But you saw all sorts of things in security. So Julian will remember this as well. The first time, you know, the whole thing about mobile phones, I was actually reluctant to take mobile phones in. I just said, not the job of security, it's a distraction. But the Shul board voted for it. And I said, I want to vote. So they voted for it. And it was just before Rosh Hashanah. So we, we sprung it on the community with, with no notice. And I remember the Britannia, I was covering the Britannia. We had about maybe, can't remember, several hundred people 
and we took in about 60 mobile phones on the first day that we did it, which was a lot. And I thought, and then I went over to the main shul where Julian was running things. And we counted 180 mobile phones. Uh, there were, I mean, he had a table, row upon row upon row upon row of mobile phones, more mobile phones you, than you'd have in a car phone shop or, or a mobile phone shop. But we had other issues with, you know, suspected car bombs. Uh, we had one bar, you know, one simcha where we had um, um, someone had used a, a vehicle in an armed robbery and had dumped it outside the shul. And it was very suspicious. We had to call the bomb squad in, so we had to seal everyone into the shul building. Um, but you know, I have to say, you got to know doing security at Southampton. You got to know the community very, very well. You got to know a lot of things about the community. You got to know a lot of the history of the individuals in the community. And actually, as a community, there are. I mean, everyone says this, <clears throat> but um, it actually is true. I mean, there are. There is no other community in the UK, certainly worldwide, that I've ever encountered like South Hampstead, which has the level of community feeling and support. You know, it, is, it seemed to be a, a kind of high-end, wealthy shul, but it's not. Not everyone is. There's a very big mix of people of wealth and income and background. And everyone has comes from a particular background. Everyone has a story. But it's very welcoming, very friendly, um, and in this kind of the last ten months, it has been the most remarkable community in terms of keeping things together. So, you know, credit to you guys. You, you you've been, uh, you know, the stuff that you do. There's no other synagogue I've encountered anywhere in the world that does as much as you guys do online. You've been a tremendous success. You know, it's been a huge one. So that that's, I mean, that's as much as I can say. I'm happy to take questions or comments or input or anything like that. Sandra, how about the, the bits when you went to you went to Israel and, and you came back with a beautiful bride? Oh yes, that's right. I, I keep forgetting about that. I mean I shouldn't I shouldn't do that. Thankfully the time difference in New Zealand right now is that she's asleep and she doesn't have the link to this anyway. So um I should should never forget my, my, my wife. I, I made in 2008, my mother moved to Israel. The synagogue that she was, she'd been a member of, we'd been members of for 40 plus years, was closing down, was amalgamating with another. And she said, well, I'm not moving to that. You know, she always wants to be within walking distance of the shul. She said, I'm not moving house and I'm not going to that shul. So I said, well, why don't you go to Israel and, you know, start off? She was 74 and she said, all right, I'll do it. So she went and I thought 2009, there'd been the global economic um crisis global financial crisis and I was just a bit fed up of, of London I thought where where was I when I was at my most entrepreneurial and when I was 19 uh, one of the summers at university uh, in my teens at university I used to supervise uh, the production of kosher smoked salmon for Pesach across Scotland uh, so I'd go to all these smoked salmon factories um and um you know supervise be there for a week at a time or four or five days at a time we produce tons i mean just for the week of pace the scottish smoked salmon industry would produce something like 10 metric tons of smoked salmon um but i got to know the fish industry quite well and i had this idea about selling smoked salmon to israel so i approached one of the companies and said listen would you bank me for me to go off to israel and, and sell smoked salmon so i spent six months in israel uh working um you know, to build up a market for Scottish smoked salmon. And I did make a bit of money on it. Um, but anyway, it was quite entrepreneurial. I had nothing. I was 19 uh, years, uh, no, I was 20 years old at the time. So when I was in 2009, I thought, well, where, when was that my most entrepreneurial? Well, I went to Israel, I had no money and just what I had. Uh, so I thought, well, why don't we do it again? I'm not married. Uh, let's give it a bash. You know, let's see, let's stretch myself. So I went. I managed to get myself a job at the University of Haifa as a um, part-time professor um, teaching HR and organizational behavior, which is my field. Um, and then picked up some work doing consultancy uh, jobs, did some research there, which got a fair bit of publicity in the uh, Israeli press, looking at how Israeli companies um, engage their employees. And then 
on one of the consultancy jobs met you know uh my wife who was kind of a feisty new zealander and who didn't have much time for me um and but you know we kind of hit it off we took her out for dinner and then while i was in israel she said look why don't you start going here and she said look why don't you come over to to, to new zealand went over to new zealand she toured around a bit i remember we ended up in in Christchurch, which just had been hit by a massive earthquake and uh so i proposed to my wife um at christ at christchurch i was mean, mean to propose to her various points of the way but i didn't have the courage and then we booked to kiddish for shabbat and this was a friday and so on the plane just about to take off from christchurch airport from the rubble you know and there was an earth there was a volcano in chile so their flights were completely disrupted just as we were on the plane i turned around to her and said listen will you marry me and she said yes so we got married on this plane engaged on this plane in christchurch airport uh, which just after I'd proposed to her, the plane aborted its, its takeoff, so it was ground to a juddering halt, and then went round again. So we got engaged, we got married in Jerusalem, but the field that I'm in in Israel, uh, there wasn't huge demand for, for it, and it was a bit of a struggle to get a job. I mean, the insight there is that if you're going to make Aliyah go to Israel, either go when you're older and you've got, you're well established and have your cash, but if you're going at a working age, um, you know, it's a bit of a tough one, especially if you're good at your game outside of Israel, because Israeli companies and Israeli managers are often frightened of people with more experience than they have, because they think it will make them look bad. So, um, you know, it wasn't working job-wise, so I came back with, with Beverly. We, we landed back just before Christmas in 2012, I think, just that, you know, a couple of months after we got married and re-established ourselves in the community. Um, and since then, we go to New Zealand pretty much every year to see her mother. My mother's still in Israel, but she's now sadly got dementia. But she's physically fit, but you know, mentally not quite there. So, and that's how I met my wife, I suppose. Got two kids, and they're good. Sanjoy, um, first of all, I have to apologize. I suggested you, for the Gillian, in the first place. And now I feel guilty that you are leaving the Northern Hemisphere just because we asked you to do my story. It, it's, <laughs> the, it's the most extreme reaction so far. <laughs> no, it's, 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 not, it's, not in re, it's not in reaction. It's basically, I mean, look, I mean, the reality is I haven't seen my family since uh, the first week of August. And the way things are going, if I didn't go now, by the time I actually get out of quarantine again in, in New Zealand, uh, Sophie was born on the 2nd of March. By the time I get out, it's going to be the 11th of March. And what made me realize was that I have not seen her from for five months for a year. And if I don't go now, I probably won't go or we won't be back together till the summer. And it will be one year. And I'll, I will have missed a huge chunk of her growing up. It's also not fair on Beverly. I mean, Beverly's mother, she moved there to help her move into shelter housing which has been accomplished that happened uh, last week so beverly is now in a smaller flat smaller apartment with two kids on her own it's still the school holidays schools go back in a couple of weeks and it is a struggle and i don't think it's fair uh for her to be looking after two kids on her own i know my mother had to do it with me for years uh and that was one child um but i think it's not fair i, do, I just don't want things to be repeated again uh, and I don't want to be that distant father, so that's really important for me. I had a question actually, which was um, about your time in the British Army. Did you meet any anti-Semitism? And you, you mentioned the kosher uh, food part, but was it difficult being Jewish more than otherwise? Or Indian? No, not really. I mean, it's, it's an interesting question. I, I know I was watching Lawrence Collins's um, uh, session about anti-Semitism in, in the, the law. It's a common question. Um, in reality, no, because I think people look upon me as for my colour first rather than being Jewish. It's more of a surprise when they do find out that I'm Jewish, especially with my name. Uh, so it wasn't so much of an issue and there wasn't really, I mean, when I went to a test, basically swear, you know, you swear allegiance. And when you sign up, they, they have all these kind of forms and there's one for religion what religion do you want to declare 
and they have loads of codes going from I don't know what the A is, but the last one I remember was Zoroastrianism um, and Judaism's there. And the, 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 the sergeant there, he said, Jews, oh, gosh, we haven't had Jews <laughs> having to look through the code. And he said, how do you want to swear? I said, well, listen, I'll bring in my own uh, Torah, my, my own Pentuach uh, to, to, to swear. Um, Food-wise, I went vegetarian. Um, I get vegetarian rations. Uh, you have to make stuff up and bring stuff in. It wasn't too bad. Um, at the time I was in, it was a time of huge change in the army. So they just abolished the Women's Royal Army Corps. So you had men and women being integrated for the first time. Lots of regiments and units were being, you know, it was post-Cold War, being merged and, and disbanded. So a lot of change going on. So it was not so much for um, attention um, to Jews. It was just interesting comparing and contrasting the British army versus the Israeli army. Um, and I think the thing you realize with the British army, one, one was the food was better. Yeah, much, much better food. Uh, Israeli army rations are pretty grim, um, often cold and in a tin. Um, the, uh, equipment level in the Israeli army was much, much better. So they would always get, it wasn't necessarily the best equipment, but it was the most serviceable, usable equipment. And it was very, you know, it was very well put together. British military equipment was often designed to support British industry and was not necessarily stuff that other countries would buy, frankly, like the standard British army service rifle, the Israeli, I use an M16 or something like an M16, and I had maybe about six or seven parts to it that you could disassemble and assemble very quickly. I can still, even even my dreams now, you know, years later, I can still remember how to assemble and disassemble rifles. Um, whereas the British Army weapon, the, the SE-80 at the time, had 16 parts to it. and was incredibly fiddly, um, not particularly well manufactured. Um, I mean, the social life in the British Army was much, better the drink was cheaper there was no drink available in, in israel at all It was completely dry i mean the only thing you ever got was kiddush wine uh and that you know you really wouldn't want to hit a bottle of kiddush, kiddush wine uh, um yeah so anti-semitism not really uh, but you did racism in the british army at that time there was a, there had been scandals in the 1980s and there were many many less people of color in the British Army at that time. So I was very unusual uh, at that time. At Sandhurst, I think I was the only person of color, of color who was from the UK. Um, in my battalion, there was myself plus one other. But over the years, things have changed a lot. I mean, you know, I remember allowing the, the, the army was talking about the Ministry of Defense allowing uh, gay people to serve. I remember the commanding officer said over my dead body said, I do not care what the rest of the British Army does. We will be the last battalion to admit gay people. And that's completely changed. And, and actually for the better. Um, so times have moved on and it was good to be in the army then at that time. Well, I have one more question. I'm then going to open it to anybody who's interested. Uh, can you just tell the story about Monty Richardson? Yeah, I suppose it's it's a remarkable life. I suppose um, I, you know, everyone has loads of people on this call have had remarkable lives. There was a chap, and many, pretty much all of you will know him, called Monty Richardson, who was um, a real mensch and a half. He studied economics at Cambridge in the nineteen thirties, just before the Second World War. Um, He'd had a, a year operation that had gone wrong, so he was fundamentally deaf in, in, in one year and uh, so wasn't eligible for service. But instead of going into banking or, or, or the city or whatever he could have gone on to, he devoted his life to social work in the Jewish community, uh, working for the United Synagogue. Um, he was a prison chaplain. He was the longest serving pr prison chaplain in British history. He himself would make a great uh you know uh, session my story but um i became quite close to him because we kind of lived in the same neighborhood i'd walk back with him we'd have a drink uh when he was ill in hospital i used to go and visit him every day and you know there's only so many hormolous meals costume which you can take in a day and he'd always try and palm off his his uh, 
her molus meal onto me by saying, just try a little bit of this just for taste. And then you'd end up coughing a lot, doing him a favor as well as, as well as yourself. So um, when he, um, he died and it was a great sadness when he died. And I, I felt quite close to him. And I think um, this is something that my wife has pointed out. She said, you often attach yourself or become quite attached to uh, men who are kind of father figures because, um, you know, your own life, my own life, there wasn't really a father figure around. Um, so Monty was probably one of those kinds of people. And, uh, you know, he had the, the wisdom, um, the experience to kind of give that kind of advice that you wouldn't otherwise get and kind of lack from my own dad. Um, so anyway, when, when, when he died, it was a great, great shame, very, very, you know, it wasn't great for anyone. But um, when I made Aliyah, I remember, you know, speaking to someone, you know, potentially for a job, and he said, you've got to change your name. He said, no one can pronounce the name. No one understands the name, you know, you know, ditch the name. So when I was making Aliyah, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, what name shall I take? You know, I need to change my name, but I didn't want to change my name fully. So coming through Ben Gurion Airport, the Duty Free is run by an Irish company called James Richardson. And um, Israelis can't pronounce unusual Irish, Scottish, many other names apart from Hebrew names. But the thing with James Richardson, one, everyone knows them. Everyone has their plastic bags because they produce the strongest plastic carrier bags in Israel. <laughs> uh, so it's a well-known, you know, He's, you know, people know how to pronounce it. So I said, I'll take the name Richardson. I went to the uh, the Ministry of the Interior, Clark, and they said, can I change my name? And I said, yeah, can I change it to whatever I like? Yep, sure, you, you can call yourself Bill Clinton. Yep, absolutely, you can call yourself George Bush, whatever you want. Um, and could I call myself King George? Yep, you can call yourself King George. So I said, listen, I'll change my name to Richardson. Um, so in Israel, my Tudad Zut actually says Sanjoy Richardson. And um, but everyone, I've never ever had a problem with pronunciation. They have problems with the first name, but Richardson, they definitely know thanks to James Richardson duty free plastic bags and Monty Richardson. So I took it, I thought it'd be a fitting way to keep that name going. And my kids are named Richardson, so uh, but it's caused problems when my wife, being an arch feminist, um, she, she's kept her maiden name Beverly Paris. And we were thinking, what, what do we call the kids? You know, Paris Mukherjee Richardson. No, it's too long. Uh, Mukherjee Richardson. So it's, it's, they're called Richardson. Just makes life easier. Lovely, lovely. Can I open it to questions? Anyone have any questions for Sanjoy? Eddie. Unmute yourself. Unmute yourself, Eddie. I, we can't hear you. Had this Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Sandra, thank you very much for your fascinating and frank uh, speech or talk. I've got a couple of questions. You and Julian have good military backgrounds, but very few of us in the rest of the community have that advantage. Do you think one can be an efficient security officer without that kind of military background. And secondly, would you like to say a bit more about your work in HR and uh, I think you said operational? Well, organizational behavior. Yeah, sure. Yes, yes, I please. mean, listen, the, the first question, rather than me um, answering it, Julian's probably got more of an insight. So Julian, do you want to come on or? No, no. Okay, all right. No. So listen, I mean, having a military background doesn't necessarily give you, um, it gives you certain insights. And you know what you're doing? I mean, Julian is is much fitter, probably much fitter than I am. I think Julian was not on combat instructor. He's, 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 he's the tough one. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm, but it does give you certain insights in terms of basic things like, say, um, procedures, processes, etc. You know kind of how to work that. But anyone who's in certain jobs, you would know how to do that and thinking through things. You would know through, but it can take a bit of time if you if you if you're coming at it from afresh. You might look at it logically and think through, but if you've been doing it for as a full time job for a number of years, 
you know, right, we need to sort this, 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 this out. You, you, you know it in, in, in a matter of minutes or seconds as to what needs to be done. Uh, so it does give you that kind of advantage. Um, I think the second advantage is you kind of know some of the threats or the risks, certainly with firearms and explosives that could come around. So, um, you know, it, it, it does help. It also teaches you, you know, in terms of organising others, you know, getting them on the road to getting, getting the shift, trying to persuade people. It's the, the, the people side, I think, is the biggest help of all. I, I mean, I think that hopefully answers that. Um, in terms of the other point about HR and organisational behaviour, yeah, my, my, my PhD looked at how you transmit the culture of an organisation to new recruits in the army. And um, when I went to Israel, I actually did further research and specialised in looking at international cultures and how, because a lot of the principles of management or how companies manage is they look at it either from the UK or the US, but when you're dealing with people from, say, India, Israel, Indonesia, the national cultures are very, very different. You know, what's expected and what's not expected, uh, what goes down well and what doesn't go down so well. And that's a huge, huge that, that's my kind of main area, I would say nowadays, of, of research interest is um, how na international companies uh, manage or how things land differently in different places. And, um, you know, you see it, I mean, a lot of the companies I've worked in, for example, HSBC, the BBC, have global operations. And it's something I'm always very conscious of is that what works in one country might not work on, on the people side or might misfire completely um, somewhere else. You know, mm -hmm. so in, in a place like um, you know, trying to be very pally or chummy with employees, would not go down well in a place like, say, for example, uh, Romania or in China or in India. You know, um, what people are prepared to tell managers, their senior managers back, you know, some places will be quite frank and quite open. For example, in Germany, maybe, maybe less so in Germany, uh, but like, say, in, in, in Sweden or Scandinavia. Other places, they will be, they'll be tight lipped, they will cover up any kind of problems that they've had. So, that's something that I look at and apply a lot in, in my own work. I hope that answers your question. Yeah, thank you. Yep, Karen. Can you unmute? Yeah, I'm doing that now. Um, <coughs> somebody else asked you about um, racism in the army. Yep. <coughs> As a child, did you come up against racism at school or in the community? Yeah, that is a very, very good question, Karen. I'm, I'm glad you asked that, actually. So that sounds like a very politician's answer. It's not, but genuinely is glad. Um, I would have to say, yes, very much so. I went to a Jewish primary school in Glasgow, which at that time was a private school, private Jewish school, but everyone, most people went to it if they could afford it. Um, and the level of racism by um, other students, was huge. Um, I would say race abuse pretty much every day. Um, the, um, in the streets of Glasgow, you would get an occasional um, situation. I think there's a bit of background noise. Uh, is, oh, some, I think I'm just getting some feedback. Sorry. Oh, that's better. Thanks. Um, so there was there was huge levels of racism. Um, Glasgow at that time was you get some people would be quite normal with you. Uh, most people were quite normal. Some people would be quite cool towards you. But up to the age of about I'd say twenty into well into my twenties, you'd walk around the streets of Glasgow at least once a year. I'd get punched, kicked, hit by random strangers, completely random strangers. And I'm not just and so you learn how to run. And you learn how to fight. And um, in terms of my, you know, fighting abilities, I learned that at a, at a Jewish school where I was the only person of colour, where there was racism was rife. The teachers would do nothing about it. Um, and uh, quite frankly, I, I learned how to um, 
defend myself and give as good as I got. Um, and um, I, I make no errors of it. It was really, it was really, really quite bad. And I think educationally, was I interested in this school? I think one of the reasons why I didn't do so well at primary school was frankly the level of racism. I mean, there's a lot of exaggeration. You might get think well, there's a lot of exaggeration, but literally every playground you'd get called every playtime every day three times a day you get racist names or hurled at you um so it wasn't particularly a nice nice school whereas the secondary non-jewish secondary school went to there were more people of color so there was less tolerance of that sort of thing and everyone kind of rubbed along together enjoy uh can i ask you lovely to see you by the way i'm sorry we're losing you to new zealand <laughs> of all places but i understand um can you tell us a little bit about your life when you were in Israel and you were involved in a film, which uh, kind of controversial, but it was about the Palestinian-Israeli issue. And I wondered if you could describe what happened there. It might be interesting. Yeah, no, no. Thanks, Paul. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm, moving, I'm moving to a country. I, I, pl I played rugby at school, uh, not to any particular good level, but all my schoolmates were very good rugby players. And um, yeah, I'm... I'm uh, you know, the, the All Blacks maybe will get that, that uh, cut back from South Africa. Uh, but going back to that film, I was, when I was there in, in Israel, um, you know, in 2009, 2010, uh, you know, I was working part-time as a professor. Academics don't get paid too much in Israel, and when you're part-time, you get paid even less. Mm -hmm. So to supplement my income, there was a film, Channel 4 were making a film called uh, The Promise, uh, in Israel, and it was a huge film production, a huge thing for Israel because it was the largest film production they had had since, I think, one of the Rambo films. It was a 20 million pound budget, all of which was going to be spent in Israel. And it was by a uh, film producer and director called Peter Kosminski, who was Jewish, or certainly had a Jewish-Polish name. And uh, it was set at the time of uh, post-war in the Palestine Mandate. And um, I had no idea what the script was. <laughs> None of us knew what the script was. I was brought in basically to help people because they had lots of extra scenes where they had to get people dressed up and kitted out as British Army soldiers. So I'd been in the army recently. I knew how to do it. Um, I was quite efficient. So um, I'd end up working, getting the uniforms together, getting hundreds of extras. I mean, in some cases, thousands of extras ready. Um, um, but the, the script was, I think they, it, it portrayed the Jewish struggle in Israel in, a, in an inaccurate and frankly, I think false light. I mean, it historically was false. There were certain things in it which just did not match. And uh, we didn't know this at the time. And when he did show the, the, um, the premiere, in, in, in Israel to the staff, people who'd worked on it. Some people, quite a few people walked out. I think probably about half of the, the people who'd worked on the film walked out of, of, of the thing. Um, there, was a, there was a lot of controversy at the time. Uh, there was a lot of tension between Peter Kosminski and the staff. The ones who actually were more um, anti Kosminski were funnily enough, the British personnel who'd come over to do the film because they thought he was uh, very offhand. He had no, like during, it was Yom HaShoah, uh, which is very, very important in Israel. And they, they have the siren blasting at 11 o'clock and everyone stops work. And so 11 o'clock, it was on the order sheet, the call sheet for that morning, 11 o'clock stop work. He himself didn't stop work, just carried on working. And at that time, the entire Israeli staff, the entire Israeli crew, were probably at that time, maybe about a hundred or so that day, just basically threatened to walk off the set and just leave him to his own devices. So he had a lot of issues. And I think he was just very, very insensitive and to um, the, the, the situation of Jews and, you know, of Israel. He was completely insensitive to it. And um, his crew, the British crew didn't like him that much. The Israeli crew really didn't care. They just wanted to do the job and get, get the cash really. And do the best job that they could. So that was that was that really. Does that answer your question, Paul? Uh, yes, I, I must say that that 
series uh, I watched part of, the part that really annoyed me most was how he portrayed Bir Yassin as a kind of casual massacre by the Israelis just walking around shooting people willy-nilly. Um, and I thought that that was so far from accurate that it was disgraceful. I don't know what you thought of some aspects of the film. Well, some of the some of the aspects, like the Dear You Seen thing um, at the time or when they were fleeing, I mean, the British, the British crew were very, very unhappy with it. They didn't like the portrayal because they thought it was inaccurate. A lot of them had worked on historical dramas and they put a lot of store by accuracy uh, and they weren't happy with it. When it was the, the, the leaving of, of uh, Israel, some of the bomb, with King David bombing, some of the stuff, a lot of the crew were very, very unhappy um, with it. Um, and I, the Dear You Seen thing, Dear You Seen wasn't, you know, was not uh, the War of Independence's moment of glory for sure. But I think the portrayal of it was just inaccurate. There was a lot of inaccuracies in that film and it was wrong. But I will say this I mean, listen, at that mm -hmm. time, I did not have, you know, I had a very low salary and someone came along from the UK and said, listen, work hard, you'll get your money and you'll get your meals a day, you know, cost your meals, by the way. Um, you know, and, and to be honest with you, if I'd known how it have turned out, maybe I wouldn't have taken the job. But at the time, it was a job and there was nothing else doing. Do we have one any last question? Because we're coming up to the hour now. Anybody? have a question they'd like to ask. Yes. Patty. Um, I'm interested, you've you know, spent a lot of time in Israel. Oh, can you hear me? Yes, yes. yes. Uh, you've spent a lot of time in Israel over, over your lifetime. And I'm just wondering what you feel about the country now and um, what do you say about, about you know, how you found it when you went there originally, um, and how, what was your experience in the army and how you feel about it now? Quick, quickly, I suppose, politically, when, when I was younger in my teens, I was very too much to the right, um, kind of like Amos Oz, very from, a, you know, my, my family aren't particularly, well, they are right and left, but they're, uh, I was on the right wing of Israeli politics. I did back the could. Now I'm probably much more, on the, I am much more on the left. Um, when I first went to Israel in the 80s, it was kind of, it was limited supplies. You, there were lots of things you couldn't get. You, everyone on this call has probably experienced that. You go there, you go to a shop. Well, we've only got this and this. Um, I think my experience in the army was during the first intifada, and that kind of you realise there was judgment calls. You also realise there was. It, it's not an easy situation for a soldier to be in in Israel, a private soldier, if you're a, a conscript, to 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 make big judgment calls. But I think now, after the Oslo Accords, things have changed. But right now, I I, I struggle with it. I, I really, there's a lot of things that the state of Israel does, or the government of Israel, the politicians of Israel do, which I really, really disagree with. And there's a fourth general election coming up in Israel. I have the right to vote in Israel, be an Israeli citizen. Um, and I, I, I would not be voting for Likud. I would not be voting for the right wing parties. Um, Benny Gantz has kind of blown it, unfortunately. Um, ironically, his, his sister was a Hebrew teacher in Glasgow, so I think he's actually been to Glasgow. His, 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 his sister was a Hebrew teacher of mine. But um, it's very disappointing. As a country, it's got a lot to offer. It's a huge lot to offer, but it, I also don't like the modesty of blowing their own trumpet on a lot of things, which is not necessarily, some of the stuff isn't necessarily accurate. Um, some of the stuff's very propagandistic, um, and I find that very uncomfortable. Um, I think modesty is a good thing to have, but um, yeah, I'm, I'm not on the right anymore, put it that way. Does that help? Sandra, that was really fascinating. Thank you so much for a very interesting story. You might not think it, but for us it was fascinating. And we wish you every success in New Zealand, but we hope you're going to come back to England eventually with the family. I hope so too. I really do. Listen, All take care. Best. Thank you. Have a good morning. <laughs>